Mr. President, the, we've talked about this recently more than we have in, in quite some time. Uh, you know, it, defending America needs to be our number one commitment. Uh, to many of us, it is and has always been. And that's why we've been coming down to the floor and talking about the National Defense Strategy, the uh, Armed Services Committee. We have the honor and privilege of hearing from you know, some of the really well-informed people, members uh, and, and people from the outside, and they're looking, they, and they see the threats that we are facing. Now, they don't always agree with each other, but I really believe that we're in the most threatened position we've been in as a country in, in uh, the years that I've been here. And um, that'll come as a little surprise because people, they, they know that uh, we've had threats. We've been uh, at war for two decades, and we still have the threat of terrorism. It's out there. They've seen dangerous behavior of rogue states like Korea. I like the idea that the, um, the administration came up with. Uh, we're looking at our peer competitors. Our peer competitors are China and Russia, and these are, these are countries that have actually passed us up in many areas. When I talk to the American people around, I go back to my state of Oklahoma, and when they find out that we have countries that actually have things that are better than we are. I mean, uh, the, the quotes that we've heard from our, our various top people on the, uh, the, the types of artillery that they have, that our competition has, then at the same time, not only do we have pure competition uh, from China and Russia, but we also have the rogue countries that are out there uh, North Korea, Iran, and all of that. So the threat is there. It's, it's, uh, and it's, it's a very real thing. So um, we um, need to have the answers. The Department of Defense creating the new defense strategy. This new defense strategy was one that I think was done very well. It did take in, into consideration the, uh, the, the problems of countries that are peer comp uh, competition along with uh, other, uh, the, the rogue nations. And I think it has done a really a good job. Now, one of the things that I've really appreciated, we had a hearing about two weeks ago on the, uh, on the, uh, the National Defense Strategy Commission that was put together. I've been here for quite some time and I've seen a lot of commissions, a lot of reports come up. And I've never seen one that had, so you wouldn't, wouldn't even call it uh, bipartisan. It's, it's just nonpartisan. Uh, one of the individuals, uh, Gary Roughhead, uh, Ab an admiral who is a co-chairman of the, uh, of the uh, uh, National Defense Strategies Commission, said that he didn't have any idea who on that commission were appointed by Democrats and by Republicans. It was equal, equal Democrats and Republicans in the House, and Democrats and Republicans in the Senate, but it did come out in just the, with the, the, the very difficult truth that we had to deal with. And uh, I think that uh, co, the co, one of the co-chairmen was Ambassador Edelman, and he was said it was so bipartisan that there was no way of telling who appointed whom. So, Anyway, uh, this is something that has been put together, and the commission uh, report has a bunch of stuff that, that tell the whole ugly truth. It's, it's an ugly truth to realize, particularly when you talk to people in the real world out there throughout America, they assume we have the best of everything, and to find out that we have a, uh, we, we have a, a real threat uh, it kind of makes you go back and remember the good old days of the Cold War when you had two superpowers. We knew what they had. They knew what we had. And, uh, and you know, mutual assured destruction meant something. It doesn't mean anything anymore. But uh, one of the significant individuals on this, this report was Senator Kyle from Arizona. And, and the reason I say that is Senator Kyle, in my opinion and the opinion of many people, is one of the, has been historically in the United States Senate and uh, one of the if perhaps even the most knowledgeable individual on the threats that we face and our capabilities that we have in this country. So uh, it's, it's unique that Senator Kyle was on this commission because when he got on the commission, he was not a member of the United States Senate. He came back after the death of Senator uh, John McCain 
and uh, served for it appears to be just a short period of time. So he has the unique position of serving on the commission and also being the uh, being on, for many years on the uh, uh, the uh, in the position to help us meet something that we haven't met before, and that is a real real challenge. Now, Senator Kyle, why don't you kind of talk about the maybe the Senate, uh, the, the bipartisan nature, and how this thing fell together, very similar as was uh, expressed when we had our meeting, I think two, two or three weeks ago of this commission. It's been very successful. I applaud you for your work on it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, or Mr. President. Uh, I would like to thank the Chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee for engaging in this brief uh, colloquy and specifically for uh, calling the hearing a couple weeks ago at which the two co-chairmen of the National Defense Strategy Commission presented the findings of the commission report. And uh, I agree that that uh, hearing attended by, I believe, every member of the Senate Armed Services uh, Committee was a remarkable hearing because the members of the commission, represented by the two co-chairs, uh, made it clear that their report, our report, was indeed a bipartisan document and nonpartisan, as the co-chairman Admiral Ruff had said. Uh, perhaps it would be good just to um, dwell for a moment on how this commission was created, and uh, then we can talk a little bit more about the report itself, because I think one of the biggest factors about the report is the credibility of the people who helped to design it. A couple of years ago, the two armed services committees in the House and Senate uh, put a provision in the National Defense Authorization Act to create a commission that would be comprised of 12 members, uh, six of whom appointed by the Senate, five, excuse me, and six appointed by the House. And they would be appointed three each by the chairman and the ranking members of the two armed services committee. So there was a balance of six Democrats and six Republicans. I think, and I say that because like Admiral Ruffhead, I'm not sure of the politics of everybody who served on the commission. They all knew my politics. I was a retired Republican senator at the time, um, and I knew a couple of the other members of the commission. But frankly, the politics uh, were left at the door. And we went in and debated uh, about the status of our national security, and in particular, the Secretary of Defense's uh, national strategy and concluded, first of all, that the Secretary was correct, that we had to reorient the priorities of our national defense to reflect the fact that China and Russia now both presented a challenge to the United States that had not existed in the prior several years, but that are increasingly difficult to confront and important to confront because of the attitudes of those two countries, and that the other threats from Iran, from North Korea, and from terrorists, while still very significant, uh, would be relegated in effect to a secondary position. We thought the Secretary's strategy in that regard was correct and commended him for that. And we also found that the basic strategy he laid out for confronting the challenges was satisfactory, but with a big caveat. And that was that unless the Defense Department was adequately resourced to confront these challenges, the strategy could not succeed. So much of what the Commission uh, dwelt on was what we would need to do in the near and, uh, and medium future in order to rebuild our military to successfully be able to defend the United States against these emerging threats. And you know, that's one of the things that uh, I was really impressed with on, on this report. You, didn't, you guys didn't hold any punches. I mean, you said exactly what it was. You said what areas. In fact, I have a list of the quotes that were in there, which I actually used on the floor uh, yesterday, I guess it was, of the, of the different members, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the, uh, the Secretary of, of Defense, and, and the rest of them, that showed very clearly that, that we don't, it's not adequately resourced, and we're gonna to have to do something about that. Now, I do wanna ask what your recommendation was on the commission to do it. Where's that chart? No, that's not the one I want. Get the one that is, uh... yeah, this, this is kind of a shocker for a lot of people. I mentioned that people don't realize that we're, this is just one element of it that shows 
that the China is actually passing us up and by 2030 is going to have a larger navy than we did. You and I have, have been in both the House Armed Services Committee and the Senate Armed Services Committee and have watched and it, it's kind of hard to conceive that the time that we were always feared was going to be there is there now. Yeah, so, you know, when you are now, we are now faced with that problem, what kind of recommendation did the, did the commission come up with to get us out of this hole? Uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, the chairman of the Armed Services Committee is exactly correct, and uh, you could uh, illustrate the same thing with charts relating to our Air Force, with our Army, with the Marine Corps, all elements of our services. And it's not just in the number of ships, but in the quality of the ships, and both the Russians and the Chinese, I would note, have made some significant advances in submarine technology, for example, that will pose a real threat to the U.S. Navy. What the Commission concluded was that three major changes were necessary to the way that we fund our military. The first is that the top line, the total amount that Congress appropriates each year, needs to be increased. We didn't specify a particular amount, but we noted that just to satisfy the 20-year budget projections of President Obama's Secretary of Defense, um, this would require a minimum of 3 to 5 percent increases annually above the rate of inflation. In other words, real growth in the top line spending. Secondly, and these are two faults of the United States Congress. We, the Commission pointed to the Congress and said, you've been funding government for far too long with uh, continuing resolutions rather than getting on with the job of passing appropriations bills that actually note each year's requirements and appropriates an amount of money to reflect those requirements. The continuing resolutions, or CRs, make it almost impossible for the planners in the Defense Department to plan more than just a couple of months in advance. And when we're talking about enormously uh, long-term acquisitions costing billions of dollars, this makes a very inefficient way uh, and an effective way to fund defense. And finally, we recommended that the, ninth, that the Budget Control Act, which currently controls the way that Congress spends money, needs to have a change in it. The sequestration trigger in that bill has harmed defense spending more than anything else and has resulted in about a half a trillion dollars over 10 years in lost uh, appropriations for the Department of Defense. That law is still in effect and it will govern the appropriations of the last two years of the decade of its being in effect unless Congress repeals it or modifies it. And so the third recommendation is that the sequestration trigger in the Budget Control Act needs to be eliminated. Yeah, I think uh, that's been something we've talked about for a long period of time, but I think, you know, we have to recognize the, the problem that we have been in back during the Obama years, during the last five years, and, and this is a shocker when you, it kind of gives people an idea of how we got into this mess to start with. Uh, if you take and use the years 2010 to 2015, that would have been the last uh, five years of the Obama administration, using constant uh, 2018 dollars, in 2010, the, the uh, budget would have been $794 billion. In 2015, $586 billion. Now, that's, that's a reduction of, uh, of uh, $210 billion over a five-year period. Nowhere else in government did we have any kind of a reduction in any program. But that's where we got, uh, it really got into trouble. And I really believe that we will have to face this uh, and, 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 and recognize the, the, what the problem really is and tell, the, tell everyone that what the problem is. Now, I say to my friend from Arizona, you've been active in, the, in nuclear deterrent, and you know we have not been so much. Uh, I can remember and you can remember back in the 60s when this was recognized as a problem. And I think the last time that we did any m nuclear modernization was actually in, in the 80s. So long. Now, uh, the, we have the triad system we've had for a long period of time. China didn't have it. Russia didn't have it. But today, they got it. 
and they are, are actually have done more. We had a, a chart for this, but it shows what we have not done and what they have been doing. So in the area of uh, nuclear, uh, a nuclear deterrent or nuclear modernization, uh, it might be a good idea f to see what you folks on this commission were looking at in terms of that threat that we're facing. Mr. President, and I certainly appreciate this comment of the Chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee because the Secretaries of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs have all said that our strategic deterrent has to be our number one priority. And why is that? Because this is the one area where the entire United States security is at, at risk. Uh, uh, this is the existential threat, the threat that could destroy the entire United States. Now, obviously, a nuclear war between either the United States and China or Russia uh, would be devastating to the entire world. But because it is a direct threat to the homeland, it has to be the number one priority. And yet, as the chairman notes, um, through our negligence, the administrations and Congress's past, uh, we have allowed three things to deteriorate all at the same time and the bill is now coming due on all three, and therefore it's going to be a, a difficult proposition to get funded. The first are the laboratories in which our nuclear weapons were designed, and there was testing, and to some extent they have been um, uh, modified or, or refurbished, and they have had their life extended through a program operated at our national labs. The national labs are in incredible need of modernization. You have a 1946 built facility in which our uranium is being produced. The roof is literally falling in. I've been there at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, in Los Alamos, there is a great need to make changes and we have to create a new facility for the production of plutonium pits. This is all highly technical, but the bottom line is that our laboratories are in dire need of refurbishment. Secondly, the weapons themselves, the nuclear weapons themselves, designed in the 50s and 60s and some as late as the 1970s, but built in the 70s and 80s, are in extreme need to have, uh, to be checked for their safety and their security and to have their life extended by the replacement of certain components and making certain that everything else is in operating order. I, I know I was given as a souvenir a vacuum tube that was taken out of one of our nuclear weapons, uh, having been replaced with a more modern circuit board. These are the kinds of things that are, we're doing to extend the life of these nuclear weapons, and it's not inexpensive. And third, our triad, our delivery systems, the bomber force, the intercontinental ballistic missiles, and our nuclear-powered submarines that, have, that carry the uh, missiles that currently represent part of our triad and our strategic deterrent have all been allowed to deteriorate and need replacement at the same time. So instead of doing this seriatim, we're faced with a bill that is going to come due for all three. Now, the good news is, through the good efforts of the Chairman of the Armed Services Committee and others, um, provision has been made in the past NDAA uh, bills to begin this modernization, and it has begun, but barely begun. And it's going to have to continue for a period of 13, 15 years, something like that. The other piece of good news is that while all three of these components of our nuclear deterrent are, uh, are needed and are going to have to be paid for at roughly the same time, at no time in the budget do the combination of all three of these things represent more than 6.4% of the defense budget. And in fact, in most years, it's three to 4%. So for the most strategically important element or component of our national security, we're really spending a very small amount in proportion to what we have to spend on everything else. And uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, the committee, I think, has found it so important to ensure that all three of these things move forward on time in the right way so that our strategic deterrent will, in fact, deter any potential adversary from miscalculating and thinking that the cost of uh, 
of aggression against the United States is worth whatever they might seek to achieve? Well, we've uh, done a lot in the, um, the recognition of what is coming up, and, and I can't tell you what, how much, uh, how important it was to have this document. It's the first time I've seen everything written down so we understand it and the unvarnished truth about the threats that are out there. So right now, we're doing the, uh, 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 we have this as the, as the blueprint that we're using. We'll also be, be uh, doing what we did this last year on the NDAA. The National Defense Authorization Act is one that has to be done and done uh, in a timely manner. And we were able to do it last year. We're gonna do the same thing this year. But when you talk about rebuilding the, re the readiness uh, the uh, the uh, brigade combat teams were down uh, at the at the uh, two up to about two years ago, where only 35 percent of them could actually be used. And of course, the Marines and the Navy used the F-18s. Only 31 percent of those are actually flyable at that time. So we have a, a lot of that type of thing that's going to that is going to be necessary. You mentioned the triad. Yeah, that's a lot of people don't know what that is, but it's. Uh, it's important that we now, now, now that both China and Russia know what it is, it's important that we do the job that we're supposed to be doing. Acquisition reform, I can remember the time that you and I both, the, the senator from, uh, from um, uh, Arizona, and I were both on the House Armed Services Committee, and at that time we were talking about acquisition reform. That was 30 years ago, and we haven't been doing it. We have now uh, some really dedicated people who have a background in that. We're gonna actually try to get something uh, done. But the main thing right now, I think it's gonna to have to be funding. We have to recognize that uh, it's going to, uh, it was interesting that, the, uh, that when you mentioned the three to 5% increase in funding over and above, over and above the um, amount of uh, inflation, you stop and think about it. When we started out two years ago in fiscal year 18, we raised it to $700 billion. In fiscal year uh, 19, raised the budget for the military up to uh, uh, $716 billion. And then the first budget that came out from this president for fiscal year 20 is, uh, is uh, uh, 733. Now, if you do the math between fiscal year 16 and fiscal year 33 is only increasing it by 2.1%, which isn't even inflation. So we're not uh, at that level, we're not carrying out the recommendation that came from your commission and all those individuals that, who agree with the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Secretary of Defense, and everyone else who is knowledgeable in the field. So we've got our work cut out for this. Mr. President, uh, I couldn't agree with the chairman more, in fact, I applaud you, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, and the Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee uh, for going to the President along with uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis and talking about the need to continue with uh, his defense um, modernization and noting the fact that the improvements that you've made in the last two years have not rebuilt the military or even begun to close the gap. It's staunched the flow of blood. It's been like the tourniquet on the arm to prevent any more uh, loss of blood for the military. But you are absolutely right. And what the president then said after his meeting with you, that he thought a number of somewhere around 750 billion was a more accurate number, is exactly correct. In fact, um, I think it would be a little more than 750 billion to represent the 5% above the rate of inflation, or 3% above the rate of inflation. I'll have to do the math when I sit down here. But, but the point is, some people think that the last two years, because you all were very effective, this is before I came back to the Senate, in uh, staunching that flow above, that th therefore the, uh, the fight is over. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth, uh, really, a 13 to 15 year program uh, to rebuild our military has just begun. And I have to say that the, the figure that we're talking about right now came right out of this book. You guys did a great job, and my hope is that you'll continue to serve in some capacity, because we desperately need you, and uh, it's been great to have you back for however brief a time. Nonetheless, we've accomplished a lot during that brief time. Thank you. Thank you. With that, Mr. Um, President, I yield the floor.